Welcome to the Truth and Liberty broadcast. We believe we have a mandate to bring godly change to our nation and the world through the seven spheres or mountains of influence. To further this cause, we give away a product every week that will empower you to get involved in changing your life and changing our world. You can register for our weekly giveaway by subscribing at truthandliberty.net. You can also subscribe to our newsletter to receive weekly updates on guests, news, and much more. This is an interactive live cast and we welcome your questions. To ask a question during the live cast, use the comment or chat features. Now get ready to dive into this week's topics with our hosts on location in Colorado, USA. Hello and welcome to the Truth and Liberty live cast tonight. I'm Mark Cowart sitting in for Andrew Womack. And have we got a program for you tonight. We have a very special guest, Lucas Miles. He is a pastor. He's the author of a brand new book that's just come out called The Christian Left. And uh, it's going to talk about how liberal thought has hijacked the church. And I tell you, his uh, resume here and all the things that he does is so much I'm going to toss some of that to you here in a minute, Lucas. But before we get to our special guest, Richard, you've got some special things to share with us before we get into that. So let's get started All with right. that. Well, thank you, Mark. Lucas, it's great to have you with us. We've thank been you. having an awesome time here uh, tonight, just uh, visiting before going live. So I know this is going to be a great show. Thank you to all of you for tuning in tonight. Be sure to let your friends and family know about the live cast. and. Uh, I think that this is going to be one of those uh, nights here on Truth and Liberty that we're going to remember for a while. So, uh, but thanks for watching tonight. Speaking of our uh, the website, if you haven't checked out our resources page, please do that. We update that all the time with uh, new information and new resources. Uh, one of the ones on there that I'm really excited about is Biblical Citizenship in Modern America. Uh, Rick Green has uh, just released that, and it is taking the nation by storm. Churches all over America by the thousands are signing up for this new resource to equip uh, believers to stand up for truth in the public square. So check out our resources page where you can find a link to that and many other things. We've got some great events coming up here at Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College. Uh, of course, Christmas is here, uh, but after the new year, uh, Andrew's going to be in Phoenix, Arizona for the Phoenix Gospel Truth Conference. And he's going to be ministering with our uh, beloved E.W. Jackson, one of my favorite preachers in the whole world. And it's going to be awesome. You want to check that out on our website at wmi.net slash events, January 6th through the 8th. I think it's in Scottsdale, Arizona. Then the Orlando Gospel Truth Conference, February 10th through the 12th. Uh, that's going to be a great time as well. Uh, if you live in Florida or those uh, the area around there, uh, check that out. And then the Karis Men's Advance. This is one of the highlights of the year uh, at Karis Bible College and Andrew Womack Ministries. It's scheduled for March 10th through the 12th, and uh, it's going to be great. I suspect that uh, um, probably um, we're going to have, I don't know if Tony Dungy is going to be back or, uh, or others, but it's going to be a great deal. And then Cam Karis Campus Days is April 6th through the 8th. And I'll never forget Campus Days. That's when God reached down and touched our lives in a mm -hmm. major way, changed the course of my life. We left, I left my legal career and came out here and, and went through uh, Bible college as a 20 year lawyer. And it was awesome. The best decision me and my wife ever made other than following Jesus. Um, if you're not a subscriber to Truth and Liberty, I want to invite you to do that. We send out uh, emails and blog posts all the time with helpful, useful information and analysis that you don't want to miss out on. Just go on our website, upper right hand corner there, click subscribe and share your uh, email address with us. And when you do, you'll be uh, eligible to receive this week's free product giveaway. Last week, we gave away Andrew's book, Find, Follow and Fulfill God's Will. It is one of my favorites of his books. It's full of practical information, useful tips uh, as you'd like all of us are, are seeking to find God's perfect will in our life. Uh, subscribe today and be eligible to receive that. And then this week, our product giveaway is Andrew's book, More grace, more favor, releasing the untapped power of humility in your life. And uh, I tell you, I've been studying humility over the uh, last year and I'm, I'm uh, excited to let you know that I've achieved it. So. <laughs> 
Uh, no, but in your but, humble opinion, <laughs> in my humble opinion. But, but uh, moving on here, also I want to say we we depend on the generosity of you, our members here at Truth and Liberty. If you're not a member, I want to invite you to prayerfully consider becoming one. You can just go on our website to the donate page and uh, select become a member. Sign up to make a recurring gift of five dollars or more per month, and you'll become a Truth and Liberty Coalition member, and you'll help us take the gospel to the world and establish truth in our culture. And last thing tonight is if you need prayer. Uh, just call into the, the 24 7 Andrew Womack Ministries prayer line at 719 635 1111, and someone will be, uh, will be more than happy to agree with you in prayer. Mark, back to you. Awesome. Well, I tell you, Richard, I am so excited about our guest, Lucas Miles, just to talk about how small of a world it is. So, I found out you let me know. We met yeah. about five years ago. Yeah, maybe five, maybe six years ago now. And yeah. that was at Church for All Nations. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Through a very mutual dear friend of ours, this ministry, Dr. Dean Radke. Yeah. And of course, uh, Dr. Radke, whew, he has imparted into my life over the last yeah. three decades in a huge way. And then you pastor a church mm -hmm. in South Bend, Indiana. And when Dr. Lester Summerall was alive, he was our pastor. And God used him in incredible ways. So, as Richard, you said, before we got started, we were just going all over. But let me tell you what I love about you, Lucas. If anybody's heard me for any length of time, they probably heard me mention the Black Robe Regiment. Mm. And that was a backhanded comment by the British yeah. against the pastors and clergy of the day. And what they basically said, if it hadn't been for the pastors or the Black Robe Regiment, because they typically yeah. wore yeah. those, they said, We'd have won this revolution. And so, as I've said before, the one string on my banjo is pastors have to rise up I in agree. this hour. And Lucas, we want to hear, first off, you tell about what all, you've got a media company, you pastor a church, you've got all sorts of things, more than I could keep up with. And then we want to talk about your book because I noticed you got an endorsement from Governor Huckabee, and I really like him. Mike Huckabee Incredible. is a breath of fresh air. But uh, he says you expose the subversive threat that Marxist thought poses to Christianity and the global church. And, you know, the church is supposed to be shaping the culture, but the culture yeah. has been shaping the church. Yeah. So tell us more about your ministry and yeah. let's get into what your book well, first off, guys, thank you so much for having me on here, both of you. It's just a real honor. I mean, what you guys are doing every single week is is uh, it, it is it is encouraging and equipping. I think pastors like myself across the country um, with the knowledge that they need to be able to stand up in this time. So it, it is so important. Um, you know, so my wife uh, Christy and I, she's she's at home watching right now. Uh, you know, we have been in ministry now. This is our uh, we planted a church 18 years ago, and we're still pastoring that same church. And, and uh, in today's world, most marriages don't even last 18 years, <laughs> let alone most churches. And so, you know, to be at the same location for this amount of time, they've just been such a blessing for us. It's such a great home base for us there in South Bend. And, you know, um, I, I didn't, five years ago, I didn't know I was gonna be out here, you know, at the front line on the conversation of faith and politics. I didn't really have that, that vision. Um, but, but uh, and actually when I sat down to write this book, I was planning on writing another book. My wife and I had taken a cruise and I was gonna start a book on the cruise and, and uh, I was intending to write a book on influence. Yeah. And that's the name of our church, Influence Church. We don't spell it with an I, we just starts with an N. And, and uh, I had read an article on the flight down to Florida um, that just, it just moved me. And when I sat down to write, mm. I just started going and I wrote almost three chapters on that short little cruise that we did and just buzzed through it. And I really, um, I feel that the, the, the fight that the church has right now against the heresies that are rising up in it of progressivism, of leftism, it is potentially the most important fight the church has ever had. I believe that the divide between the Christian left and uh, what we'll call the biblically orthodox church is greater than even the divide during the Protestant Reformation now, between Lucas, the Protestant church and the Catholic church. That's an interesting the Christian left. Yes, sounds. I like figured a we'd have to talk about that. So, tell us what the Christian 
Christian left. So yeah, and you know the viewers at home, they can see this here. The Christian left, you know, and you have on here this this uh, little this little symbol. This is the sim this is the actual symbol that that uh, people that call themselves either progressive Christians or uh, Christian socialists use. So it is it is the, uh, the the communist sickle, and it is the a tilted cross instead of the hammer. So you mean this is not just a graphic for your? This book is not cover. a graphic that we're trying to make a dig. This is the symbol that is used by the Christian left. If you if you Google progressive wow. Christianity and you click on images, you will find this image in there. It's used by them. And so I believe that when we talk about, um, uh, you know, groups of people that are starting to go astray in the church, we need to use the terminology that they use. They call themselves progressive Christians. You'll hear conscious Christians or the Christian left. This is a term that the media uses. And so in order to really make sure that we're talking about the same thing, because people want to know who, who is this group? And to put it maybe succinctly, I believe that the Christian left is, is a growing constituency of left-leaning Christians, and at times Christians in name only, who have embraced Marxism, critical race theory, uh, all sorts of liberal and progressive ideology. Uh, they've embraced uh, the world's definition of gender and sexuality and marriage. Um, and, and they are uh, really, you know, the way I say it is that they are, um, you know, the, the Christian left, they've exchanged the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for the trinity of diversity, acceptance, and social justice. Mm -hmm. And so this is the group that we're talking about. And I believe that in the last five years, it is exp that demographic has exploded. Exploded, and I think most of Christianity was not ready to actually deal with what came. Mm. So this is a group of Christians that are still identifying as a Christian. Yes. But they've embraced and accepted all those other things yeah. you said. To me, there's no other thing that could line up with than what Paul told Timothy, that in the last days mm. there would be those that depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits. Exactly doctrines right. Doctrines or teachings of demons. So there's almost like this biblical base for what they're... Yeah. Yeah, and so the, in the same way, and I know you guys have talked about this a lot, in the same way that we're seeing uh, an attempt to revise our Constitution, we have those that with that same spirit, that same critical theory, you know, that is behind that, driving that, that are trying to revise what Scripture says. Um, and so even something as simple as, you know, the, the idea that you'll hear as Jesus was a socialist. Mm -hmm. And so this is a belief that is held by those on the left who, you know, consider themselves Christian socialists, where they hold a tenet to that. They would say things like, you know, would Jesus get in the way of a love between two people? <laughs> and they would use that as an argument yeah. to try to support same-sex marriage or whatever else that, you know, uh, whatever, you know, other buzz, you right. know, topic or agenda that the left is going to have at a given time. And so um, we have seen a tremendous movement, um, you know, in, in, in the political world, even somebody like Obama, who called himself a Christian, who, you know, um, in, in his first term sort of seemed to, you know, I mean, he said he was for a, a biblical or traditional view of marriage. And that changed very quickly, you know, after yeah. he got into office. Uh, we're seen that with people like Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who was the mayor of our city, South mm -hmm. Bend, who ran for, you know, Democrat for president in 2020. Uh, we're seeing that with a lot of the political figures, but I think more so than just the political figures, those guys are easy to point to. We're seeing this in churches. We're are seeing it in mega churches. Right. Right. We are seeing it with pastors. Yeah. Um, you know, even when you look back to uh, 2020 during uh, everything that was happening with the, uh, the, the riots and the, the conversations around race, so many pastors did not know what to do at that moment. And they began, you know, out of, out of a place of empathy, beginning to um, start conversations within their church. And the conversation very quickly moved to a place of talking about equity over equality. I actually had a pastor that I, I listened to his message here recently that um, compared um, he was talking about critical race theory and, but, you know, talking about that, that we need to apologize for our whiteness. We need to apologize for, you know, the, the, the privilege that we have in our lives and beginning, and this is from the pulpit. Mm -hmm. And this is happening not just at one church. This is happening at churches around the country. Now, I want to, I have not read your book yet. I will be reading this, but do you get into the specifics? So the, under these different topics and heading, you give a specific example. Do you yeah. name names in here? I, I, so it, it's, it's interesting. When I wrote this book, I, you know, there's 10 chapters and I, I wrote, I wrote nine chapters and I turned it in. And, and I said, okay, I think I'm done. Gave it to the publisher and working with some great people over Broad Street and, and uh, they read it. And I, I gave it to a few other trusted people. And I said, hey, love to hear what you think. They came back. Every single group of person, every person I gave it to said the same thing. They said, 
we think you're missing a chapter. And it was the chapter that they said, you have to tell us who these people are. Yeah. I was talking about the theory and the theology behind it and the historical examples, because this isn't new. We could, you know, we could go back to the early church. There was progressivism in the early church that they were facing, that they had to root out, even what you're talking about with, with Paul mentioning to Timothy. They were yeah. seeing some of these things already. Um, and, and I really went to the Lord, and I, I, I didn't feel, I, I, I felt at first, you know, God, is it right for me to, to really go through and, and go, this person right here, this person right here. And the Lord brought me to a scripture where Paul says, look out for Alexander the metal worker, you know, and he gives this whole warning. And, and, and we see in the New Testament, the, the, the writers of the epistles, they name names. Paul wasn't afraid to name names and tell people this. And so I have a whole chapter in here that I call the Christian cabal. And that is, you know, really a group of individuals who are very prominent and prevalent mm -hmm. in the Christian world, in the Christian greater industry and uh, Christian education, Christian music, uh, um, mega churches, these things who have embraced uh, ideo progressive ideology and they are now really pushing this through in the pulpit. Lucas, where can we get a, folks get a copy of your book? Yeah, so they can head over to lucasmiles.org. Uh, they can grab a copy there as well as some of our other uh, resources, sign up for the mailing list, all of those things. Mm -hmm question, Lucas, you point out the problems, you identify people. Do you give some steps for action to take that yeah. we can take? Yeah. You cover that in the book? Yeah. So, you know, when you, when you look at this, it's very easy. Um, and especially with a cover like this, you expect this book to be, you know, just hammer it home against the left. And although I, I do that, um, I, I really felt like the Lord led me to a place to be fair because we have issues on the right. We are seeing godless conservatism. We are seeing um, people within the church that have gotten caught into what I call a cycle of worry, anger, and apathy, mm -hmm. where they are so uh, um, just, you know, they're watching the news cycle. They're so frustrated with what they're seeing going on and how can these people sleep at night and how can they do this and how can they do that? And they get so uh, um, kind of tied up into this that they're many times losing their witness and, and, and they've, they've, uh, they've stepped outside of walking in love. And so I really wanted to provide a resource to people to help them come back to not only biblical orthodoxy, but how do we walk in love in the process? Uh, because this isn't just about being right. If our goal is just about to be right, then you know, I don't know how far that's gonna get us. Mm -hmm. But we wanna influence and change the world. And we have to do, we have to have compassion. And I have compassion towards so many that would consider themselves progressive Christians or the Christian left because they have, they have bought into a lie. They have been fed this and they think sincerely that they are doing what is right. They think that they are following the ways of Jesus. But what has happened is they've actually disconnect, they've disconnected themselves from the word of God and they've started drifting out into these dark waters of progressive ideology. And I think you hit the nail on the head because I am a word person. Yeah. The Word, the Word, the Word. Uh, to me, the Word of God is like the tracks that the train runs on. So if you take the Word out, you don't have anything to, to move forward on. Right. And then the heart is deceitful above all else, yeah. desperately wicked. And we have a spirit. A, it, these things are so spiritual because as I've, as I've looked at the news and you see the political arenas and big tech and then the religious circles, you know, there's not enough people that know how to cause that to all work together. We're talking about mm -hmm. principalities yeah. and powers. Yeah. And so, you know, I place the blame squarely upon the church for the things that we see going on. Yeah. Because Jesus said, if we cease to be salt, then we're good for nothing yeah. but to be thrown out and trampled. So I believe in the simplest format, we get back to the word. So you give some practical steps in here. Yeah, and, and, and maybe, it's, maybe it's helpful to go back to kind of where did this come from? Right. And so, you know, historically, when you look at this, um, you know, back in the 1700s during the, the Enlightenment and the post-Enlightenment period, there was a tremendous rise in the age of reason and the mm -hmm. age of logic. And so everything had to be rationalized. And so what was happening is Christians at that time who had been influenced by philosophers like Kant and Hegel, they began l rethinking their approach to Christianity. And they thought, well, is, is really everything in the Bible rational? Is it believable? Now we would say that the life of the believer is a life of faith. But they wanted to apply ration to this and, and reason to this. And so they began doing what they called a, 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 a basically critical theology, where they would begin going through specifically the New Testament and the life of Jesus. And they would start crossing off everything that they thought might be myth, might be exaggerated, in order to do what they called the quest for the historical Jesus. 
And so there was all of these Christians that were rising up writing books. There's actually hundreds of these written written during the uh, late 1700s, 1800s, and even into the early 1900s about the quest for the historical Jesus. Basically, who is the real Jesus behind maybe the mythology that have, has potentially risen up within the New Testament, the, the supernatural. We know that Jesus couldn't have walked on water, so that's not true. We know he couldn't have written, been risen from the dead, so that's not true. So they started crossing these things out. Well, that movement was highly influential. And during the launch of really the, uh, the new wave of Bible colleges that we have, most of them started right around the turn of the century. Mm. Those, those Bible colleges were tremendously impacted by this, and that theology eventually crept in. And especially as it got into the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, you started having uh, progressive professors, mm -hmm. which were shaping now progressive pastors, which were now shaping progressive parishioners. And that trickle down in the church created a perfect framework that combined with the seeker sensitive movement. That's what I wanted to ask you. About. Is <laughs> it, was a, it was a boom of the, the seeker sensitive movement. I'm so thankful for them in the sense that they did a tremendous job making converts but they did a really poor job making disciples. Right. Mm. And I know as a pastor, so many of us, were, we're reading the books and trying to get the trends and all those sorts of things. And, and I think now in hindsight, we realize that you cannot make a disciple without the word of God. Right. And so um, it just created this perfect storm for liberal ideology to be inserted into the church. And I think the left has realized how powerful the church is in America. The evangelical base and the Catholic base, largest voting bloc in the country. And if they, if they don't influence that, if they don't infiltrate that, then they can't win an election. And so they had to spend time and money infiltrating those bodies of people. So you, you mentioned the seeker-friendly movement. Um, <clears throat> I, I personally am of the view that the mega church movement, the seeker-friendly movement, is one of the most damaging things to the body of Christ ever. Um, and, you know, Jesus said that uh, if you abide in my word, then you will be my yeah. disciples indeed. And have we sacrificed in the, in the church world, have we sacrificed discipleship on the altar of numbers? Yeah. So I, I was actually, I, um, I was on staff at a church in Ohio that before we planted our church, it was actually our sending church that sent us out there. And, and it was a small town and we only, my wife and I only had one car at that time. She took it to work in Toledo and I would walk to the church and there was an old railroad track I'd walk along. And I'm walking that track one summer day and I'm eating an orange. And I felt like the Lord spoke to me and I was, I was probably 22 years old. And uh, so it's about 20 years ago. And, I, and, and the Lord said, do you like that orange? And I said, yeah, I like this orange, it's good, you know. And he goes, what do you like about it? Well, it's a seedless orange. And I said, well, it's easy to eat. It's not messy, I get able to just put it in. And, and he goes, that's what my church has become. Sure. And, and so essentially we have what I call the genetically engineered church, is we have, in oh, order to make it more wow. consumable, we have extracted the word of God because people don't choke as much. That's powerful. And so it was done in an attempt to, with good intention, to make an easier on-ramp for people to come to the gospel. So they basically boil it down to this simplified John 3.16, Jesus kind of message, but they miss the discipleship, they miss the deeper things of Christianity that are necessary in order to reproduce a movement. And so when you extract the word, and I agree with you on that, the, the, the seeker sense of movement, and, and not only that, even the churches that were impacted by it that are still only 100 or 200 people that are trying to follow that same, you know, blueprint are still doing this where they've extracted the word. They're no longer teaching scripture, no longer teaching the Bible. And now we have a church. And what's the thing about a genetically engineered piece of fruit? It might be consumable, but it can't reproduce. Can't reproduce. That is so wild. So, you know, we're, we work a lot with David Barton, David Barton and uh, Barna Research that uh, yeah. George Barna. Yep. <clears throat> but the most interesting statistics were the five metrics that we use nowadays to determine the success of a church and its attendance budget, programs offered, square footage, and uh, attendance. But the interesting thing that riveted me, we have in the last 20 years, we've had an increase of megachurches, but in that same two decades, a decrease yeah. of 20% wow. of professing Christians. Mm -hmm. And the very thing you said, Richard, was Jesus said, if you continue in my word, and uh, that is a rev. I'll give you credit one time on that. After that one, <laughs> I'm going to preach that one. <laughs> okay. that is, oh, full provision. That full is provision. a word. 
word. Oh Thank my you, God. Lord. Thank you. You know, it, when we, and, and I think this is important because I, what I wanted to do in this book, there's already so much division in the country. And when you write a book that's entitled The Christian Left, it, it just kind that of, you, ex, you expect it's you know, divisive right off the get-go. And, um, you know, but, but when you look at this idea of, it's not a word that we use very often anymore, but orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. This old Christian word, and it, it's two root words, ortho and doxy, and it means right teaching or right mm. message, okay? And so as Christians, we all want to operate in orthodoxy. We want our churches to exist in orthodoxy. And there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, and as charismatics, we don't talk about that as often, right. you know, but I think that we should. And so the, the picture that I felt like, uh, and I use this picture in the book that the Lord gave me to understand orthodoxy that I think is helpful, is I grew up near Lake Michigan and I'm a terrible swimmer, so I have to be very aware when I'm out there of, you know, the, the undertow and everything else. And they have these big giant swim buoys that float on the surface of the water. You know, it's big orange and white thing that, that floats there. And it's got a cable or a chain that attaches it down to the bedrock with some sort of millstone or concrete block down there at the bottom. And so that is able to sort of float around in this circle. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's what orthodoxy is like. There's a, there's a chain in the bedrock, which is the word of God. And it is the absolute truth. And it has a fixed, fixed reality that is absolute and its existence is found in Christ. Mm -hmm. um, but our understanding that our beliefs have the ability to kind of float around in a circle. So for example, somebody might believe in speaking in tongues, somebody else might not. Somebody might believe in once saved, always saved, somebody else might not. And we can say about these that although I have very strong opinions about each of those doctrines, that they can exist within the realm of orthodoxy, mm. assuming that the primary teachings of Christianity are in place. The Lordship of Jesus, the virgin birth, death, burial, and resurrection, uh, the return of Jesus. You know, we can start going through final and judgment. final judgment, all of these things, uh, the, 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 the supremacy of the word of God, you know, all of this. And so we, we look at this, what happens with the Christian left is the first thing that was severed was this cable to the truth of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And so because they now see the book, and actually I, th I think it was a, um, a Pew Forum study that found that I believe it's only 24% of the church, I want you to hear that, 24%, is all that's left of Christians, uh, church-going Christians, who believe that the Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God. So now 76% of those in the pews next to us believe that the Bible is something less than mm. that. Now a percentage believe, well, it is, it's, you know, it's inspired, but it's not inerrant or, you know, it's, it's, it's good teachings and these sort of things. And it goes on down the list from there. But what has happened is that 76% are those that have either become susceptible to the message of the Christian left or have embraced the ideology themselves. Mm. And so if you don't believe that the Bible is the foundation, how do you prove, you know, that, that a biblical view of, of, of gender or sexuality is true, mm -hmm. or that, you know, uh, what God says about, you know, uh, uh, his moral standard or these different things is, is accurate, or even something like the, the value of freedom over tyranny, right. you know, uh, and how do you defend that? And so it, it has changed the conversation within the church to now, instead of going, but the Bible says this, it's very easily to well, I don't, I don't believe that that contextually is all for today. And so mm -hmm. they're able to sidestep that in their minds in order to, you know, really uh, introduce all of these bizarre doctrines. Wow. You know, uh, pastors, if you look back again at the America's founding era, David Barton, there's no one better at this. He's, he's got hundreds of these sermons that pastors yeah. preach back. It was on everything from earthquakes Anything, to marriages everything. to the uh, uh, upcoming military parade. I mean, all kinds of subjects and topics. It seems like today that pastors view their role really as evangelist almost. And they're, they're wanting to get people saved on Sunday morning. But in the meantime, is the church really being grounded in the truth? Are they really learning what scripture has to say about things like private property, for example, or sexuality and marriage, for example. What do you think about that? Well, to quote our, our friend, uh, uh, Dr. Dean Radke, Christianity is a total involvement process. Mm. And it it's not, doesn't just involve one thing. Christianity is spirit, soul, and body. Yeah. You know, we see Jesus and the Apostle Paul, we see these guys, they, they spoke to every single issue in society. Right. And so the idea that, that and so this is, this is essentially a lie that has been produced, and it was produced over this issue of separation of church and state, mm. which I know you guys have talked about a lot. I want to bring maybe, you know, a, a, a unique point to this. The first person to talk about um, really in our, in our, at all, anywhere close to being a modern era was John Calvin, who talked about the idea of the separation of church and state. Calvin's idea on this was actually that it's a good thing, but this is how he defined it. 
He said that the church should always be far enough away from the state that the state can never tell it what to do. But the church should always be close enough to the state in order to be her conscience. Mm -hmm. And I believe that if we're going to talk about the separation of church and state, that's what it should look like. And I think that's what we saw in our founding, that the church was always in a place of proximity to the government to be able to speak to the issues, to be able to call things, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, that were that were uh, wrong, that were happening, to bring them back to the truth, to bring them back to the Lord. And I think that um, we have a group of, of clergy in America today that uh, very far from being those black robe uh, uh, pastors that you were talking about, who have embraced a mindset that they're to stay in their little corner, mm -hmm. that they're not to talk about anything other than what we're, you know, what they're told they have permission to talk about. And I think that that is, it's, it's not just hurting the church, it's, ha it's harming our, our, our culture. Mm. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah, really good. Totally. You know, I think you mentioned something else about uh, uh, the need to have compassion on people that are in uh, being caught up in the Christian left. But uh, I want to take another angle on that, Lucas, which is um, what is it that attracts people to socialism? Just the average person, yeah. not the dyed in the wool Marxist who wants to turn the world upside sure, down. Sure, sure. But the average guy in the pew yeah. who's bothered by poverty, who's bothered by racial injustice, yeah. but they may not be rooted and grounded in the word. Um, is there an element of false compassion that's appealing about socialism? So uh, maybe two parts to that. The first part is I think that um, those on the left who are drawn to this or maybe those who were sort of in the middle politically that, that you know, uh, uh, really saw what was happening in the left and, and really, uh, um, you know, started leaning that direction. They started with a compassion. They started with wanting to change the world. They started with, you know, uh, wanting to help people. And I think that what they saw in many cases was a evangelical or Protestant church that wasn't doing much about the felt needs in the world. Mm -hmm. And so the church has been very good historically as far as world missions, but we've not done very much stateside. And so, you know, you have, you have uh, um, you know, communities of people and demographics of people that I think those are kind of on the outside of the conversation have looked at the church and go, well, if you guys are so loving, why haven't you gone over here and helped this group here? Why haven't you? Now, of course, we can think of hundreds and thousands of examples of the church doing that, but that's, it's the stereotype that has just been painted for people. And so the left's view of love is that if you don't agree with me or you don't, uh, um, you know, uh, um, support me, then you don't love me. It's essentially this, this idea that you have, it's codependency. Mm -hmm. You know, I was raised, we had that Shel Silverstein book called The Giving Tree. You guys familiar with that one? I've heard of it. Okay, so when I was a kid, every elementary school in the country was reading The Giving Tree. And it was a story about this boy and a tree that they built this friendship. And the boy kept coming to the tree and, and he would, you know, want to play in his branches. And as he got a little older, oh, well, I want to build a fort. So the tree let him cut down a few of his branches to do that. And got a little older, I want to build a bow, cut down some more of the tree. Before you know it, the tree's a stump, you know, and, and the boy comes back as an old man. He's built a boat out of the tree, a house out of the tree, everything. He comes back and he just, he goes, you know, uh, he comes back to see the tree and the tree says, I have nothing left to give you. He goes, well, that's okay. He goes, you can just sit on me here and, and uh, you know, and, and enjoy our time together as we grow old together. And it was this picture of love. It was how it was presented in these classrooms of this is this great friendship and this great love. It was the most codependent, distorted story you've ever seen. But, you know, that's what, that's what my generation was raised with these types of of stories mm. teaching them that the only way that you love somebody is by doing everything that they want, by enabling them, by, mm. by you know, being, if the tree would have been wise, he would have said, you know what, I'm going to give you an apple or two so you can go plant your own tree you and you can do this. And then, uh, you know, but you, you grow your own orchard. This, these branches are mine. And, you know, when you grow up and figure that out and come back. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, which is totally anti-kingdom. It was interesting. It wasn't until Obama went into office. Yeah. So, before we went online and we had time frames like that, I would take time to receive the offering. I'd do the parable of the talents. And I talked about how Jesus took from the, the one that had the least and gave to the most yeah. because they were productive. So I'd said for 25 years, God's not a socialist. That was never an issue until Barack Obama yeah. was elected to office. And I got a three page letter uh, one time when I said that, <laughs> said that was a real good Republican uh, mm. offertory. That, and I said, well, I've been doing that for 25 years every so often. And it was kind of interesting how we've drifted so far. Now, with this corona debacle and all that, I want to, and I want to get to something. I want to ask you something here. The corona thing, uh, right before it broke out, February 6th, the Lord gave me five words. And it was change, upheaval, shifting, redirecting, and increase. 
It was the most unusual five words I'd ever had. I wrote them down right before I went to a staff meeting. I had no revelation beyond that. I just found out a couple of weeks ago, and I shared it with us before we went on tonight, a pastor friend of mine in that same month of February 2020 before it broke yeah. out, the Lord said some things are coming that will reveal the fearful church and the remnant church. Mm. Mm. So, because when you talked about the cycle, I know so yeah. many Christians are discouraged. Yeah. Some are angry. Now they're apathetic. They just want to get back to normal. I'm seeing the things that are going on as a very positive thing. And I'm seeing a chance for us with all this very wicked, evil stuff happening as a chance for our light to shine. Do you have light in yeah. this book? Is there light <laughs> at the end of the tunnel? And tell us it's not a train. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. So, I mean, here's the good news. The, it, it, to some degree, and I'll, I'll put an asterisk next to that and come back to it, the church has been here before. And in, in that sense, if we look at, say, the, the church in Rome, during first, second, and third century. Mm, yeah. There was tremendous persecution yeah. and, and, and you know, arguably a lot more persecution. I haven't seen any Christians tied up as streetlights, yeah. covered in pitch and lit on fire yet in America, thank God. And, and so the church has faced trying times before. Mm -hmm. The church in Rome rose up to such an extent that they literally changed the landscape of the entire nation. Mm -hmm. And they won over through consistent, you know, and persistent uh, walking in truth, walking in love. They won over the nation and, and they, they won the leaders to Christ. And I believe that we can do that again. Mm -hmm. And this isn't about, it's not even about, you know, set aside America or anything like this. And, and I have some unique things to say about Christian nationalism that might be worth talking about here in a second. But, but you know, set that aside. This is just about, this can apply to a Christian in any nation. It doesn't matter where you live. If you're a believer and the church can gather together and rise up and influence and, and to the point to where it is heard in the, in the courthouses and the, and the, uh, the governmental buildings of, of those, those, uh, those uh, um, you know, nations. And I think we are seeing that today in, in many cases, specifically within our states. I think the state leaders, a lot of our governors are now getting to the point to where, you know, they are beginning to talk about faith more openly. They're sharing their faith more openly and they're standing strong for these things. And I think think that, you know, um, we need to make sure we keep our eyes on the big picture, but we also need to realize that we have a day-to-day -day life as well. And, and that's where we need to walk this out and walk in love. That is awesome because, you know, one thing I've seen, uh, and I'm back to the pastors again, which it blesses me that you're a pastor and this, now what you're talking about here comes through your pulpit, doesn't it? I lost 40% of my church in 2016. <laughs> wow. And I don't own a red hat. Okay, I didn't stand up on the stage and endorse a candidate, but I began talking about what the Bible says about, uh, about abortion. What does the Bible say about sexuality? What does the Bible say about marriage? And we lost 40% of our church. And again, we're in a red state in Indiana, but we're in a blue county. And at the time, that county, our mayor was, was Pete Buttigieg. And so we were, we were right in the heart of, you know, a lot of the, uh, uh, the Christian left rising up in that area. And we also have the University of Notre Dame, which as I'll quote Lou Holtz, who called it uh, uh, Catholic in name only. Mm -hmm. and and, and so, and I'll probably get in trouble with a few people back home for that. Uh, and there's some great people in all these places. There's always a remnant. There's always those who have, who have you know, uh, uh, who have continued to stand strong for the faith and are still operating in a biblical worldview. Um, but, but uh, you know, we've, we've taken our hits at a local church level, but, you know, we've grown since then. The Lord has added to our people and I would not, I would not stop doing what I did at any point. I would do it all over again. I'd probably do it even bolder. Amen. And yeah. most people don't realize Jesus. There were things he said, and it said many yeah. left off. And they said, Lord, you said a hard <laughs> thing. And he didn't comfort them and say, oh, now hang with me. Right. He said, do you want to go too? Yeah. <laughs> and I was thinking about it because there's someone that I respect deeply. I'm thinking if I called their name, most everybody would know who this is. And he's a national leader that mm -hmm. is, I think, a, a true man of God. But he made a statement. And he said, we need someone to bring us together. And I thought, that's the most unscriptural thing I've ever heard. Yeah. Jesus said, I came not, he came not to bring peace, but to divide. Not for the sake of yeah. division, but he had his face set like a flint. And I appreciate that 
in pastors that they will stand regardless of the outcome of that. Well, you, uh, tell me this, uh, Lucas, in one of the things we saw during COVID yeah. was some pastors were taking a stand, most weren't. Yes. Many churches, especially smaller ones, have closed because of it. But those who did take a stand have prospered and grown and are thriving. I mean, this ministry uh, alone is an amazing example of that. I know your church is just doing awesome. What do you yeah. think about that? Is that is that 100%, accurate? we've seen the same thing. And you know, there was certainly a time where you were kind of going, How, which way is this gonna go? Yeah. But you know, Lord showed up and I think people have responded. So many people have come to our ministry because they saw me on a podcast like this or, or another TV show or a program. And um, you know, I was, uh, uh, my, my, first, my first book I put out, Good God, was really, um, uh, was really about trying to speak to the fundamentalists within Christianity and, and really bring them back to understanding God's grace and his goodness. A lot of what, you know, Andrew's ministry has, has really done over the years. And I've been, you know, truly blessed by uh, Andrew's work and everybody here. Um, uh, that book was not received very well by the church because it stepped on some people's toes. The church, by and large, has, has really responded well to this. Uh, I wasn't sure how it was going to go at the start, uh, but doors just keep opening. I was just with Lance Wall now, actually, a couple weeks ago down in Cincinnati ministering with him and at a conference there and Marcus Wick and some others that I'm sure you guys know. And so um, it, it's just been really cool to see those doors opening, to see people prospering despite this. And, and I think that, you know, uh, the, the real church is rising up right now and you're seeing what that looks like. Well, I've been waiting to ask you this question. I want to know uh, in, in writing this book and looking at it, what role you're saying the left has infiltrated many, uh, much of the church and leadership positions. Does money play a role in this? Yeah. Um, are the purse strings opening yeah. doors for leftists? So I'm, I'm actually working on something I, I'm not allowed because of publishing and everything else to say exactly yet on what's coming, but I'm working on a new project that's gonna go into that side of it even deeper and spends a lot more time on it. I touch on it though in this. Um, I compare this first of all, when you look back into the Renaissance time period, you had a family that was known as the Medici's. Mm. And, and the Medici's, they controlled everything from banking to uh, the, 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 the papacy. And I mean, they, they were responsible for everything. And they had under their control, um, the, you know, all the, uh, uh, all the major artists of that time of the Renaissance mm. from Donatello, Michelangelo, you know, uh, um, uh, Leonardo, all those guys. And, and they were funding a lot of their work. We are seeing something similar happen today where um, there a lot of the, you know, I mean, even our Christian publishers, most Christian publishers, as I'm sure you guys know, have been bought out by secular subsidiaries. So the secular, all you, you might have Christians at the, at the floor level, they have to still report to a secular office. And so, you know, this book went around to 14 or 15 places and I had all the Christian outlets say yes and they took it up chain to their, to their bosses at the secular, you know, parent company and they said, oh, we can't, we can't put that out there. Mm -hmm. And so, and finally found a brave publisher of Broad Street that said, we make our own decisions and we're going to put this out in the market. And it was the number one Christian leadership book in the country this last year. That's and awesome. so, you know, what we are seeing is money is being put in. Even, you know, you know, you hear the name Soros tossed out there. He's kind of become the boogeyman for a lot of people within the conservative world. But there's a lot of truth to that. And we're seeing documentation. Even the last couple of weeks, some more documentation has come out. Um, you know, Soros's group, the Open Society, they had a term that they used called rent and evangelical. Mm -hmm. And so this term rent and evangelical was used where they would put money into uh, the big one that kind of, uh, um, you know, came out and, and was sojourners uh, that uh, with Jim Wallace, who'd received quite a bit of money from, uh, from oh, I believe it was Open Society, if I remember that correctly, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for this. Uh, I can also tell you, I, I've traced this to Christian, major Christian universities. Mm -hmm. There's a major Christian university, if I said their name, everybody would know, know who I'm talking about, that has gotten $3 million from a Chinese Indonesian businessman, has now put one of that businessman's son on their board, uh, for the last five years, and you are slowly starting to see their policies over these issues shift. Wow. And so money absolutely plays a factor into it. The left knows that, and, 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 and I think that, you know, here's something that most people aren't aware of. You'll see things like kind of faith action committees or uh, your, your, you know, uh, voting in faith groups and these things. They're, they're these little pop-up nonprofits that will start every election cycle. And they are funded by the left. If you look at their board members,
numbers. It's always the same people, and they are putting money into these things, and they're creating things that appear to be par, uh, um, bipartisan and just helping Christians to be able to decide how to vote. But when you realize who's behind it, it's all Democratic operatives that are pushing this agenda, and I think the ch they're, and they're sending these resources to churches to disseminate to their people to say, here's a voting resource, a voting guide that we've put together, and they're starting to frame things like, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, the global warming is is now is now being you know called pro-life. Mm. If you're really pro-life, then you'll support the green agenda. Right. Yeah. And so you know, it's all this little deception, this changing of words that we have to constantly keep up on in order to make sure that we don't fall into deception. Mm. Goes back to that: follow the money. Yep. Yeah. Gold is money. tried by fire, and men are tried by gold. Mm. And uh, I just read that George Washington quote recently, where he said, "Few men are able to withstand the highest bidder." And um, unfortunately, we've been seeing that. Richard, I'm curious, have we got any questions coming in? We've got a few, yeah. <laughs> I want to see if we can get to some of those. Absolutely. Yeah, well, here's one from Kay on chat. Uh, a good question, really. What scripture verses are these leftists standing on to justify saying that they are Christians? Yeah, so, I mean, again, so many times they're not standing on hardly any verses at all. And when you start unpacking the verses that they do mention, it's typically a lot of, of, a lot of fluff that's there or mistranslation of things. Of course, they can't really embrace a whole lot of the Old Testament because that doesn't line up with their ideology. And so what you will see is them try to dive into the Greek to try to prove that maybe certain words mean something something different than the way they were translated, which is something that's been done with the, the, with the word for homosexuality in scripture, is they've, they've created this whole web of lies of trying to disprove that, that, you know, that the Bible doesn't actually teach anything mm -hmm. about homosexuality, that it's just you know, talking about people that had basically you know, sla you know, sexual slaves and these things. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, though, they'll stand on verses like um, when Jesus uh, uh, flips over the money changers uh, um, uh, tables uh -huh. within the temple, and they'll use that to support things like looting, things like the violence that's happening. And, they'll, and not that they're saying that Christians should go out there and loot, mm -hmm. but they're using that as a way to say, look, this is the way that, that hurt people are expressing themselves. And even Jesus did this. So we need to cut them a little bit of slack here and not talk about this. And of course, we'll see, you know, uh, this, they'll, they'll, they'll throw this idea that Jesus was a refugee. And, and, you know, which, you know, to some degree was true that when Jesus was born, he was a refugee. That's different than being a migrant and, and coming into a nation illegally. It's one thing to escape a place based upon a political uh, um, uh, persecution, which our country has always been the first to take people in for that reason. And we should continue to be the first country to take people into. And people that are just, you know, and the opposite of that, people that are just completely ignoring sovereign borders to go wherever they want to, to not follow a process. And so it's a lot of twist in these things. Yeah, well, that's great. Right. Well, here's another one. Um, who, why does no one say who they are talking about? We need to know who these mega church people are. So here we're, all, we're back to this. Yeah, so, people see, yeah. so I, I mean, the easiest way to do that is go to, go to chapter six in the book and I get, but, but I'll mention a few. So first of all, um, you know, uh, I think that we have somebody, again, I, I talk about the, the leftism within the church as a spectrum. There are hardcore Marxist leftists that know exactly what they're doing and they're pushing an agenda. And then you have people that have just sort of, this sounds good to me. And they start teaching some of these aspects. They don't realize the deception they're in. Uh, I, I've talked a lot about somebody like Beth Moore. Beth Moore's, her, her Bible studies, I mean, changed the face of women's ministry across this country when they first came out. She's since gone back and, and, and edited her books to remove anything about uh, um, uh, uh, homosexuality or same-sex marriage being a sin. And so she's very quietly kind of, you know, you know just sort of cross that out in the new editions mm. that have come out. Uh, she's supported, you know, she's, she's spoken very, you know, uh, hard against the Republican Party, against Trump, against these things. And again, I, please hear me, and, and maybe this is a good time to say this, that, that this is not, being a Christian is not the same as being a Republican. We have a lot of godless Republicans out there Absolutely. that I hope get saved. Absolutely. And this is not about blindly following a party. Mm -hmm. When you look at, you know, this idea of Christian nationalism, I believe is really a, it, it's a whistleblower term. And when you hear that term, it is the left using it to try to, to, try to uh, uh, co make a correlation between evangelical Christians and the Nazi party, because mm -hmm. that's what we think of when we think of nationalists. Well, if we look at Nazi Germany mm -hmm. and we look at who were the Christian nationalists in Nazi Germany, well, the Christian nationalists in Nazi Germany, they were known as the German Nazified church. They, they uh, uh, communicated their faith as positivist Christentum, which is positive Christianity is what they called their faith. And they embraced 
the doctrines of the state. They embraced the doctrines of Hitler, the Third Reich. They began twisting scripture to line up. They believed that Jesus was the champion of the state rather than the savior of the world. They started replacing, um, as our friend uh, Eric Metaxas talks about in his book, Bonhoeffer, they started replacing the, um, uh, the, the, the cross with the swastika and the Bible with Mein Kampf. This was the Christian nationalists in Germany. They were those wow. who bowed to the state. So who are the Christian nationalists today? It's not the evangelicals who are standing against the state in these issues saying, we're not gonna bow down. It is the Christian left. I believe the Christian left are the Christian nationalists today mm -hmm. who are, you know, it, it is, it, the, the, the left is not looking for the separation of church and state. They want a church that is subservient to the state yes. who will bow at its feet, who will do whatever they tell it to do. And I believe that they have found that church within the Christian left. Wow, powerful. Last week, Bill Federer was on, he's talking about projection and that it's a classic tactic of the left. Mm, yes. You accuse your opponent of the very thing that you are guilty of. Sounds like Absolutely. We see that in almost every single socialist and, and you know dictator throughout history. Mm. Have you got some more names? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so for example, we saw within uh, um, uh, uh, Christian, you know, pop music. Uh, there was um, uh, one of the members, of, original members of DC Talk, mm -hmm. came out and said he began calling himself an ex-evangelical and and started using this terminology. Uh, there's a there's a um, so, sort of pseudo-Christian writer named Richard Rohr, who a lot of the Nashville um, uh, community of Christians who are you know into things like uh, the Enneagram and all of this that that they're following, they follow this guy Richard Rohr, and Richard is he lives out in the middle of I don't know, New Mexico or or something like that, and he's, he's basically kind of a modern day, um, he's, he's, he's Rich Mullins 2.0 to some degree. You know, he's, he's sort of this, you have to go to him, he kind of lives in this little compound, and he's writing all these books about the mysticism of Christ, and, and really it's Gnosticism. Mm. And you, we have people that are grabbing a hold of this within the Christian music world, and he's really created a lot of impact and influence there. Uh, there's, a, there's a guy who's historically been a, um, a very well-known Christian journalist, he's a younger guy, probably about the same age as me, if not younger, his name's Jonathan Merritt. His dad, James Merritt, was a, a president, I believe, at one time of the uh, Southern Baptist uh, um, Convention, which is the largest Christian denomination in this country. Um, and uh, uh, his son, Jonathan, is, you know, has written for every single leftist publication there is. He, he seems to you know, enjoy writing about stories anytime a pastor has a moral failing and pointing these things out. He's got a real, you know, seems to have a bone, bone to pick with the church. He's somebody that I cover a lot in this book. And even within the, 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 the SBC, um, Southern Baptist Convention in general, there's been a recent takeover, you know, uh, and I, I use that term intentionally, although it was voted in, it's a leftist takeover that's happened there. And a lot of the figures that are key figures within that, uh, within that denomination have embraced things like critical race theory, et cetera. If you want to know where your pastor stands, probably go on and see if they posted a black square, you know, last year during 2020 on their Instagram page in support of BLM. And, and even if they did, I could have compassion if they did initially, because there was so much chaos going on in 2020, nobody knew what was going on, nobody knew what to do for a moment. But did they leave it there when they found out that BLM, you know, was a Marxist organization? And I'm not talking about, you know, supporting black lives. I'm talking about the organization right. Black Lives Matter, exactly. which is a Marxist organization, which has on their website, you know, at one time, they've since taken that down to dismantle the nuclear family right. and all these yep. things. Right. And so go see where your pastor stood on that. And I give some questions at the back of the book that you can take to your pastor and you can ask them or you can just evaluate yourself about the church or the ministry you're going to to see, have you ended up at a church that's part of the Christian left without knowing it? Well, Lucas, I'd like to follow up on yeah. something that you mentioned uh, earlier, and it had, I think it was before the live cast, actually, but it, it, you said that there's a spirit of Herod, if I'm paraphrasing yeah. you right, in, active in the church. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so um, in the book I call this, uh, I call this basically Herodian politics. And what we see with King Herod is that the Bible tells us that he used to love to listen to John the Baptist preach. And he would go out there and he would hear him and I'm, you know, man, whether he's pulling up in his chariot and listening from the, you know, from the sidelines or whatever. And until John the Baptist said something that Herod didn't like because it was about his own lifestyle. And then what happened? Herod had him thrown in prison. And see, this is a point. See, the, the church is not, in, or the, the state is not interested uh, in wiping the church out. They want a church that's just obedient to them. They, they value the church. They love listening to the church uh, as long as the church will teach things either that don't affect their agenda or that it has to go in line with their agenda. And so this Herodian politics, ultimately what happened is Herod used, you know, he was, he didn't have the guts to take off John the Baptist's head himself. And so he used that girl dancing in his, in his courtyard. And basically the way I call that is he used the youth of the generation. 
mm. in order to influence the attack and carry out the attack. Uh, her word that this would be issued against John the Baptist and, and, and the left, if they don't agree uh, uh, with the church, they will try to silence it. They'll try to cancel culture it. They'll try to imprison it. And if they have to, they'll cut off its head in order to get it to be quiet. Awesome. Well, uh, Lucas, uh, we're getting down toward the end here. Can you summarize sort of for our viewers, like maybe what are the, uh, what are the warning signs? What are the ideas that people need to be on the lookout for in their church, maybe with their, their Christian ministries they're in contact with or their friends and neighbors? How do they spot leftism encroaching? So first off, let me say, and to, to temper this a little bit, I am not encouraging people to go on a witch hunt. I think that we have to recognize that there is room for some diversity of doctrine and belief within the church, and that just because somebody sees things, you know, I'll, I'll get asked, is this TV mega church pastor, is he the Christian left? And most of the time the answer to that is no. He's not the guy doing this. He's just, he's preaching Christ, he's selling books, he's doing his thing. But what we are seeing is we are seeing people intentionally taking the church towards these, these really counter doctrines. And so um, I, I call them the canary in the cage. What does my church teach about abortion? What does it teach about marriage? What does it teach about the word of God? Does it teach the word of God? What does it teach about, you know, things like diversity and inclusion and equity? And, and these answers to these questions, does it line up more with what we see from a biblical framework? Does, it, does the pastor lean towards a socialist worldview? Do we see this within elders of the church. Oftentimes the pastor, you know, some, I mean, I talked to a, a mega church pastor. I won't even say the stakes. I don't want to, I don't want to out him, but he he read my book. He was, it's one of the largest churches in his city. They have five different campuses. And he goes, I just figured out I'm totally surrounded on my elder board by Christian left members. And I didn't know it. And I don't know how to change it now. And he feels like he's there, the last person trying to hold this church together to prevent these elders from taking it in a different direction. It's not always a senior pastor. It could be somebody else who was influential. So we have to look at this, you know, go through the questions in the book, you know, pick up a copy of this. And I think this is the best way to be able to get, you know, really uh, uh, your mind around what's happening in the world today and how we as individuals and as Christians and as pastors and church leaders can do something about it. Wow. So um, let's see if we get, if we can fit in one more question here, how do believers battle so-called Christian leaders who push abortion, lesbianism, homosexuality? What can the person in the pew do about this? So uh, the person in the pew, first of all, you get to vote essentially with, with your attendance and your dollars. And I don't recommend people just, if their pastor has one bad message that you just pick up and go across town, sit down and talk to them about it. As a pastor, I know, you know, I'm sure you've been in this position, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, don't, you don't know how sometimes something sounds. They can assume something about you. Sit down, especially if you've been there for any length of time, talk to your pastor, share with them, tell them what your concerns are, meet with them. But, you know, really we get to, you know, uh, don't give money to ministries that you're not sure of, you know, that you don't know where they stand on these issues. Ask them directly, tell them that these things are important. And of course, as Christians, use your, your citizenship in this country, which is something we see Paul do as a Roman citizen, to also influence a nation by doing the things that a good citizen does by voting, uh, uh, by, you know, sharing with others and really, you know, being part of, and, and volunteerism is decreased across across the board. We need Christians out there at polls. We need Christians out there knocking on doors for the candidates that they believe in. And this is so, so important. Absolutely. Boy, this has been rich. Lucas, yeah. I just want to thank you for Thanks. your boldness, for being salt and light. And I'm so thankful to be connected. You reconnected in a, in a, in a greater way. I want to encourage everybody to get this book. I haven't read it, but I've got a copy. And uh, I will be in this quickly here because I think the most important thing that I've begun to recognize with all that's going on, we have an unprecedented opportunity mm, right. right Yeah, now. we do, absolutely. You know, uh, I've told the church this, if I go out, we're at Powers in Dublin Boulevard in Colorado Springs, if I go out with flashlight at noon, Nobody's going to pay any attention. But if I go out there at midnight, you'll see me from way down the road. Yeah, that's right. And there's a lot of darkness around us right now. And I think your book is one of those that can help us shine our light and uh, appreciate what you're doing. Absolutely. And thank you for joining us on the show. And Richard, it's always a blessing to be yes, with you. Awesome. Thank you all for joining us. I want to encourage you, if you're not a partner with Truth and Liberty, please become a monthly partner and we would appreciate you doing that. And also check out our website with all the archives. We'll see you next week. Join us next time for the Truth and Liberty broadcast. Find tonight's episode and related articles and links at truthandliberty.net. Truth and Liberty is viewer supported. If you'd like to help us continue our live casts, you can make a donation at truthandliberty.net.